Thank you very much. Thank you for for a warm welcome. And I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So that's that's great to be here. Today we're going to talk about keeping tabs on production. That's the title of the presentation. Uh, you can find me first uh, at Hubert Lapitsky, if you can decipher that. Uh, type it into Google. You're going to find me uh, on Twitter, on GitHub, any other uh, services. I'm the co-owner of Amberbit. We're software consultancy. We've been working with Ruby for uh, like eight years before we switched to Elixir a few years ago. Uh, and we were very happy in, in doing Elixir on the back end side of things. Uh, you can find this presentation and the others at slides.com slash Hubert Lepitsky, as I said, any platform slash my first name, last name. Today, we're actually going to focus on debugging production issues and also discussing various things related to production deployments, monitoring, and <coughs> honestly, it's going to be a bunch of random tips and tricks, things that... Honestly, often Erlang developers will know and will think that this is you know, very basic stuff, but Elixir developers, not necessarily. So hopefully that's going to be useful at least for part of um, people who are here. Let's, let me start with asking you a question. What's the most important thing when running a business? Uh, money? Yeah, making money. And how do you make money? Well, you have happy customers, right? So you have to start with happy customers, somebody willing to pay you those money. Otherwise, uh, it's not going to work. So how do you keep customers happy? Well, you have to solve problems for them. And how do we solve problems for them? We build software. Unfortunately, sometimes the problems that are experiencing our customers uh, are caused by the software. So software is malfunctioning, there's some weird data on it and something is crashing. So basically, instead of making our customers happy, we, we made our customers sad. And we don't want to do that because money, right? So the customer said, sent us an email saying that something doesn't work on the app. And uh, they gave a vogue description like a description of, of what's happening. And we're looking at our local development environment. We're running the test. We're running the app. We can't replicate it. It works for us, right? So what do we do when it works for us? Well, obviously, ticket is closed. We want to fix it. But again, that would be easy, but we want to have those happy customers. And uh, what do we do if we want to have happy customers? Well, unfortunately, we have to use some soft skills. So they didn't tell us that when we started programming, did they? That we have to work with people, but <laughs> that's part of the package, the one that they didn't mention. So we have to write a uh, nice email to the customer asking, could you explain us a bit more what's happening there? Maybe provide us with some screenshot or you know, some information what's been happening. and. Uh, the truth is bugs are often difficult to reproduce and, and we have to engage with those soft skills and figure out what actually happens on production because we cannot reproduce it on our local development machines. And we kind of have this detective work where we have to reconstruct the, 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 the user journey because they will not tell us everything they did. They're just going to tell us, like, I clicked on this and it broke. But what they did before and, and how did it broke? Like usually they, they're not gonna tell us that straight away. So so we ask for more information. So where who first of all, who is the issue happening to? Because you know, one customer can email us, but email can be from John, but the, the issue can be happening for the Alice. So we really w want to know who is the user experiencing. And if it's a web app, we want to know what was the URL they were on. And maybe you can give us a screenshot, you know, if the user was technical enough. And, you know, another question would be when did it happen so we can track it down. Um, and often it feels like that, right? So we're just help desk people dealing with that. But we can do it a bit more with a style, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> 
So let's employ a bit more of a style and ask customer a nice way to provide us more information. And they actually send us a screenshot. And that's the usual screenshot, the <laughs> typical user-provided screenshot. It doesn't tell us much, but it does tell us some things, at least. That there indeed is an error, right, that, that we can see. First thing we can do when we exhausted the possibility of getting information from the customer is to check the logs, right? To figure out whether we have any logged information that we can correlate with that incident. And in Elixir, uh, the, the module that's responsible for keeping track of logs is called Logger. Not very uh, creative, but that's the way it is. Uh, and if you're using Phoenix, uh, it's already being pre-configured by Phoenix when you generated the application to do certain things certainly differently in production than in development and it's sensible startup configuration for, for your Phoenix application. It looks about that. So in our config, we have a configuration for the logger. It's going to handle the Erlang errors as well. So whenever a supervisor gen server, something is going to crash on the Erlang side of things, it's going to be fitted back to to the logger on the Elixir so that the report's going to be generated and it's going to use the console backend, which is the, the one backend that is being provided by the logger by default. Uh, and it's going to output that uh, log messages to the console, uh, first formatting it. We have currently four logger log levels in Elixir. We have debug, which is something that, for example, Ecto uses in um, when S SQL query is being generated. So debug messages are usually being stripped off in any production environment because they, there's a lot of those, so we don't want to have them on production. Um, there's info, warn, error, and whatever level you set in your config for a given environment, this level or any more severe is going to be present in your logs. Logger currently also comes with backends. So in, in addition to the default one, which is the console backend, you can install something else that's going to take the log messages and is going to format them maybe different way and output them into something else than the standard output. And uh, for example, this is the configuration for the paper trial backend. You just add the library, you configure it, and you, you install it, and your logs are going to be uh, this way forwarded using probably something like HTTP REST interface to, uh, uh, to paper trail where you can dis display them. However, if you're using any platform as a service type of, type of things, or you built it yourself, you might be very well okay just using the console logger because if you're using something based on Kubernetes or some other cloud thing, it, it likely already has integrations with something that keeps logs and it will assume that your application is able to output logs to the standard output and then take those logs, optionally decorate it with some more metadata and send it over to somewhere, somewhere where you can browse your logs and archive them. Inspecting logs can be tricky, right? So that's often not very easy to read. You basically have a stream of text messages, and uh, there are some paths here, some requests being sent, some crashes being reported. So we have to dig through that. And, and we, if we did our homework with the customer and they told us where the error has been happening, that's going to be definitely easier to track down the error that's happening this way. But often the errors are, are still difficult to figure out. And uh, basically, you know, we end up with that in front of our eyes. Yeah, and that's how we look when we look at that. But logs are not just uh, text messages. In fact, uh, even in the current implementation of Logger, logs are messages, like text messages, plus metadata. So um, we can use that bit of metadata to make our debugging in production a bit easier. Uh, and it's a simple trick. 
instead of having this again garbage we're gonna have a bit different garbage but uh, if we okay maybe first thing let's, let's have a look at this piece of um, log that's pretty so the things we can see here on, on the first is a piece of metadata that's how the console logger outputs it and the, there's one piece of metadata called request ID it's being added automatically by plug dot request ID that's the, that's the module that does it and since the log messages are being sent to the logger by different processes different handlers for different requests at the same time there's no guarantee that uh, request and response messages or the errors that are going to happen here are going to be one below another for the same request they can all be mixed uh, with each other so we don't know whether this request this error correlates with etc unless we have this piece of information this request id to match them against and as you can see that sometimes helps sometimes doesn't help to, co to correlate it to one to another but it's definitely good starting point to have this is done uh, as i said by plug request id and basically just one line logger.metadata adds another piece of metadata in this metadata map which is called request id and that's just a piece of string in order to actually log it to the logs phoenix already pre-configured the logger for us so we can see there's a one line uh, almost the last line there's a metadata request id we have to add that otherwise it, it would gonna be uh, ignored you can add your own metadata to allow debugging uh, pr production using logs a bit easier if we can add to each request user ID you know taking it from the Phoenix token that has been encrypted and we sufficiently high enough in the uh, in the chain of plugs we're decrypted we can set this metadata very very early and it will tell us who is the user that is making that particular request so that what when we look at the logs we are having another piece of metadata now which is user id so in, in this way we using just two lines of code we added another piece of metadata to our log files that allows us to track down issues that user is experiencing a bit easier so in our uh, UI where we display logs we just search for it and then we will get reconstructed user journey as the as it appears in the logs as the user was making requests to our application so we can track it down a bit better right so that's very useful you can add different piece of metadata as well like company ID role ID or some resource ID uh, and that can give you some closure all right so there are certain important things to know about logger uh, first of all it, it's got two modes one is async the other is synchronous by default it's it starts with the asynchronous mode which means we send uh, log messages to the logger very very quickly and it deals with it and it deals with it by first putting it on the uh, on, on, on the queue on the basically in the buffer and then it's gonna try to write it to the console or to somewhere else however if we send too much of those log messages to the logger it's gonna exhaust that uh, buffer and then it's gonna switch to the sync mode so whenever we're adding our custom logging or we just have a lot of logging we have to make sure that our backend is able to handle that amount of information being displayed in an efficient manner because otherwise the performance of our application is gonna be sever severely hurt by logger basically switching to synchronous mode and waiting for everything to calm down yeah so don't abuse your own uh, uh, log statements don't abuse the metadata um, you can abuse logger actually in other different manners you can use it to track metrics in, in the system but you probably don't want to do that um, right and if you abuse it you're gonna be punished there are some changes coming to the logger that, that just a side note uh, starting from OTP 21 logger is in OTP is being rewritten I believe 
and it's much better than it used to be. So there's lesser need for custom logger backends for Elixir and also for Erlang. Like a lot of Erlang folks used used to use Lagger. Many still do, and there's I believe there's still space for that. But for a lot of use cases nowadays, you can just switch with Erlang logger. And um, the current Elixir master is already implemented changes that are going to be quite significant behind the scenes, but hopefully for the end user for now, there's going to be very little changes because it, everything is backward compatible. So instead of feeding Erlang messages now from Erlang to, uh, to Elixir, the plan is that we're going to feed uh, all of the Elixir messages back to the Erlang, including metadata, so they're in sync. So we get common view on the metadata uh, and, and we can correlate those logs that are happening between Elixir and Erlang a bit better. Uh, so we're reversing the direction that the logs are going to. And as a side effect, we need to support a bit better, uh, a bit more log levels. So we're gonna add some uh, emergency alert critical, etc. And 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 I'm saying me, but I'm actually not working on that. So. <laughs> um, all the handlers are being written in Elixir uh, in Erlang. Uh, you can also write them in Elixir. It's a bit difficult at, at the moment, but you can if you want to. And and in theory, it can replace the Elixir backend. So instead of write, writing backends for the Elixir logger in Elixir and and doing it the way I showed you on one of the, the slides, this is all going to be uh, done on the Erlang level. But often inspecting logs is just the first step and, and you have to go deeper and you have to start poking around production. And let's start something easy. We, we have a remote console, uh, which is a very awesome tool, uh, which we can use if you're using releases that's that's the tool you, hand, you, you you can have if you're still running your elixir application using mix then don't just use releases so that you can connect to uh to your application using remote console and poke around the live running system and collect some information about it and figure out what's going on i think that's the reason sufficient enough to actually migrate to that, especially that Elixir nowadays ships with releases built in, so we don't have to rely on distillery. If you're using 1.9, I believe, uh, the releases are already included. First thing we can do when we started our, um, our remote console, and we're actually using OTP behaviors in our code, or some library that's malfunctioning, and we want to debug it, is to dig into those OTP behaviors. They're not just standards as in how to receive and reply to messages. They, all, they are also have fair amount of introspection that we can do using Erlang built-in modules with them. So the, the module to look into is called Sys. Um, and uh, in that case, we're just starting some usage calculator that can be an agent or gen server or whatever OTP behavior it is, and, and we grab its speed, uh, and then we instruct the sys module to start logging messages that are being uh, processed, which means sent or received by that gen server. And we cap it off at 100 messages so we don't kill off the production system. And we interact with this system a bit. We increment some counters, get, get some usage. What's going to happen is that the sys module is going to collect those information. Uh, I actually don't, probably it's not the syslog, probably it's, uh, there's, there's something in gen server implementation that's collecting that information. I have no idea. Uh, so basically, you can use sys to, to get that operations that happen. So we can see there was an inbound message, that was a cast, there was a reply, the state at the moment of reply has been like that, another cast, another reply, uh, no reply, and, and the state was changed, uh, and then was a call, uh, what has been returned, we can see how or didn't change the state. So that's a nice trace already for uh, our uh, gen server 
or join server-like thing, uh, basically any OTP behavior. Uh, so that's a very simple way to tr trace things that, that are coming in and out of this process. Uh, there's an alternative format to the same information. You can just print it to the console. There's also functions that allow you to print and store those things to files for further analysis if you want. This module is uh, quite verbose, so, so it's a good, good tool set to have. Uh, you can also uh, kind of trace it, uh, another function. It, it's going to work very similar to the print function, but instead of uh, collecting all the information and then displaying them when you want to have them, it's, it's going to just send you to the console this information that that's what is happening at the moment it's happening. So whenever you send a message to GAN server cast, it's going to display those debug informations for us. So we can this way learn about uh, what is going on in our gen servers fairly easily. Now, if we want to be a bit more uh, naughty, we can not only get the state of the gen server using this uh, module, but we can also replace the state, right? And now I can see all the former Ruby on Rails developers are super excited because <laughs> that's going to be the next big thing, right? Um, yeah, probably you shouldn't do that, but this actually can come in handy in many situations where you want, where you had some state and you know what the state was and something crashed and you, you want to replicate it and so you can set the state or you can, you can just do it in your testing environment and uh, you know, figure out what's happening this way. So it's, it, it's another very powerful tool that comes with some responsibility. And when you're done, finish it, right? So stop debugging so it doesn't accumulate anywhere. Um, Erlang also comes with, uh, uh, with, actually it comes with at least two or three modules that provide different levels of tracing and different interface to do the tracing. And these are good to know. YOLO, don't use that in production. <laughs> that's, uh, that's here for demonstration purposes only. Why not? Well. Maybe if you have like a very low traffic gen server that you want to inspect whatever's happening there, uh, it's not going to be bad. Uh, but in that very case, we're, we're going to trace all the messages that this process receives. So whenever a, a message is being sent to a process, this trace uh, will capture it and will send our shell a message containing information about it. So as you can see, for all of those mes messages that our PID receives, our shell process is going to receive one message and put it on the message queue, right? And the flash is going to take everything from the message queue and output it. So, so we have to do that. Um, and this is okay if there's reasonable amount of messages but i said you don't want said you don't want to do it on production because you can just trace everything right <laughs> and that will uh, result in pages and pages and pages of messages being sent to you until everything crashes right so you don't want to do that in production instead in production you want to use something called uh, recon i guess it stands for reconnaissance uh, one of the modules that Recon uh, Library provides is Recon Trace. It's an Erlang piece of code. It, do it does have some Elixir bindings, but I don't really feel like we need to use those. It's, it's, it's easy enough to use just, uh, just calling the Erlang functions. And uh, this very not great code that iterates over uh, a string split and, and does the splitting of a string 100 times, we actually want to trace all of those calls to string split throughout the system everywhere, but just capture it once. So the last argument is the safeguard telling us how many of those traces we're going to capture. And after that's being exceeded, the tracing stops. So that makes it safer to be used in production. There's also more, well, easier way to more granularly specify 
what you want to trace, whether it is going to be traces for uh, function calls everywhere or just in certain processes or for new processes, existing processes, you can specify things like that uh, in Recon and then you're going to be also presented with different output. It's got more advanced feature, like you can provide formatters on how you want these things to be displayed, but for basic usage, you just add one dependency, Recon, to your uh, Elixir application and push it to production and maybe you will thank me for doing that in a few months' time when you actually need it on production. Right, so to sum up, Recon Trace, safe on production, you can also use the development, and it also, in addition to tracing, it, it, it's got like a layer on top of the sys and other airline modules that will fetch and display you more information about the system uh, at runtime if you need to. All right, production monitoring. So before the things happen to the customer, we can also find out that they will be happening or bef before a customer emails us, we can already know about those things and that's probably the best situation to be in. Uh, one of the things we can do in, to simplify our life is to implement some exception tracking and probably you don't want to implement it from scratch yourself, right? There are libraries and there are services that provide those things, but just for the sake of it, let's have a look how one would implement exception tracking in Elixir. Basically, there are two ways. Uh, you can hook into several places, but, but wrap your code into try-catch. Uh, by that, I also mean use uh, some OTP behaviors that allow you to, for example, monitor some processes. So Erlang also has functionality to set up monitors so that you know in any cases when the process dies, you will get the message, so, so handle it this way. Or you can hook into logger. And, uh, and many tools use combination of both. Uh, as a case study, we're going to have a look at the AppSignal dash Elixir. There's probably AppSignal guys here. Yeah, right. Tell me when I'm talking something stupid. Uh, right, so AppSignal provides a plug that basically does the first thing. So all the requests that are being sent to the Phoenix application, they are wrapped in the try-catch uh, clause. And when the error is being caught, they are being uh, sent to AppSignal. Uh, so that's a nice way to handle exception tracking. But they also hook into, um, whoops, they also hook into the uh, Erlang logger. Uh, and the Erlang logger exceptions are, I believe, being caught from, uh, from, the, from the logger handler. I think I had a slide for it. Right, that's another code that, uh, uh, that AppSignal Elixir uses to add the logger handler uh, to catch basically all of the errors that are happening on the Erlang level. And, uh, and yeah, that's, that's, that's how it's done uh, if you want to catch all of the errors, you just hook into Logger. And I think that's going to be an increasingly popular way to do that with those changes to Logger that I mentioned, because that's the way to catch like everything. No? We'll see. Um, right. Uh, I wrote a blog post. It's on the amberbeat.com about uh, catching those uh, instances when web requests fail uh, and how to respond to those, you can base on that to implement very robust uh, uh, exception tracker for your Phoenix app if you want. All right. Ah, yeah. Here we go. While we're at AppSignal, if you're installing the AppSignal Elixir, it will ask you to add this line, those lines to uh, somewhere in your supervision tree. So when it's going to be executed whenever the application starts. And what they do here is basically asking us uh, to hook into telemetry events that are being generated by, not by our application, but by Ecto. So Ecto is a database access library that emits and has some predefined events and AppSignal uh, hooks into that to collect some information about 
uh, performance of the queries or what queries have been executed. So this is utilizing another library that is useful for us uh, when we monitor our production application, especially when we want to collect metrics. It's called telemetry. And this is fairly new addition to Erlang slash Elixir ecosystem. Started first as Elixir project, but I believe it's been rewritten to uh, plain Erlang at some point to better suit everybody on the beam. And they call it dynamic dispatch library. And if you look at it, it's really what it is. So it's just a library, fairly tiny one, that uh, allows you to trigger events like that. Each ev event will have some payload or a measurement, like la latency here, and the name, web request done, and, and some metadata, some optional metadata that you can pass along with it. And, and events like that can be either emitted by your own application, your own, co own code, or by something within the libraries. Uh, and that's actually more useful when that's some, somewhere in the libraries because then you can hook into those events and, and ca calculate some metrics and, and do something with them. Uh, that has been designed to do that. But behind the scenes, that just a dynamic dispatch library is just def a way to define those events. And, th and th those are the place where the callback is going to be called. And then you have to provide uh, handlers for those events if you want to do something when the such event happens and bind them to those events at runtime. The key here is that this is done at runtime. When the application starts, not at the compile time, th 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 those events are being attached to uh, those events. So whenever uh, in one of our libraries we, we, we execute the event web request done, our log response handler handle event is going to be called with this payload measurement and event name that uh, we declared first. So it's a tiny little library. Um, ideally, all of the libraries on the uh, Elixir ecosystem use it and, and, and use it extensively so we can hook into the core elements of, uh, of our system or the libraries that our system use to to provide some metrics and build up some metrics about the running system uh, is behind becoming de facto instrumentation standard. I don't know what's the adoption of telemetry in Erlang, but in Elixir, everybody is like very excited about it. Um, there are two more like side projects, telemetry metrics and telemetry polar, just to provide uh, definitions for metrics. The first one, like if you want to have counter or we want to have sum or distribution or some, something else, I believe there are a few more, uh, then you can use those. Although that library is just a basically type definition. Everything you have to do, like calculate the standard deviation, etc. Uh, you have to do it in the reporter or on the backend side of things where those events are actually being reported to. And the polar is just a gen server that wakes up every n seconds and collects some metrics uh, and generates some telemetry events that are being sent over by the reporter. So uh, the, the polar can be used to collect some information about, for example, how much memory is being used on the system, how many processes are running, um, and things like that. Right, so for example, to generate uh, a chart like that. So, so we can see here we're using, again, AppSignal to send that data from telemetry using the custom uh, reporter we, we wrote that's very tiny. And we're just collecting here information from the polar on how much memory uh, is being used by, by Beam on different parts of it. Uh, we can, you can see we have a problem here. Uh, we're counting how many processes we have on, on our cluster. And uh, you know, continuous deployment really helps with this situation. <laughs> because it wipes everything out, but at some point we'll have to implement some sort of uh, uh, something to clean up those uh, idle processes on our cluster that are no longer used. And that's fine, and that's, that's actually fine. Because of telemetry metrics being fed to our dashboard, we know that we have this problem, right? And we have it scheduled to be fixed. So 
wor worst thing would be that we didn't know we have this problem. And that's the value of monitoring, that you learn about the problems before they actually happen. Response time, again, we, we have some problems. This is actually dealing with uh, SMTP sending messages. So three seconds are not uncommon response times. Uh, we also collect it using telemetry, hooking up into the SMTP library that we use to send emails. And uh, this is another thing uh, that uh, we do, which is uh, we just collect information how many emails per minute. I think it's per minute. We couldn't configure the dashboard to say minute here for some reason. And how many events we're, we're sending uh, using uh, our system on average. Uh, so we can, we, we can see that custom metrics are there. The last thing, which I have like four minutes to, which is good because I have only one slide and very little knowledge about, is distributed tracing. And that's something I'm excited about, but something that I haven't really used in production yet. Uh, that's the keywords here are a bit confusing, so I'm just going to use my time to clear things out. There has been a project called Open Census and Open Tracing, two separate but similar projects. They have been merged to something called Open Telemetry. Uh, it has nothing to do with Erlang tracing and also nothing to do with Erlang telemetry, right? So, uh, entirely different thing, uh, but it declares a specification for something that's called like distributed tracing that allows you a bit on more higher level to collect information about your running system, about what's happening in the running system, and the keyword is distributed here. So in instead of like generating it in one trace, one big trace of events, I it can be split into smaller chunks that are called spans, uh, and one trace will consist of multiple spans, and they will consist of some events that happen during those spans. So, uh, and you can correlate logs with those as well. So, uh, so in theory, you could build a very comprehensive, very good tool to monitor your system using those building logs. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just a standard. There are, can be multiple implementations, and I believe there are multiple implementations uh, to to to, the, to those uh, to the standard, although it's very fresh. Uh, the library that I'm looking at in using is called Spandex, and I believe they currently support Datadog as a backend, which probably is the most uh, major thing at the moment in, in Erlang uh, Elixir ecosystem. So, you know, it's a commercial product, uh, quite pricey, but in the future, if, we, if it relies on the same uh, protocol, on the same standard, it would be possible just to replace it uh, with uh, something else, something open source or something self-hosted or whatever. Uh, so we're not going to be bound to one provider. And I think that's really exciting thing that I have to research and, uh, and talk with somebody about, so I'm just mentioning it. And that's it. Thank you very much.